Welcome to the Interesting Podcast, episode number 48. This episode is uh, PJ Harjma, and PJ took time out of his super busy schedule to talk to me for a little bit, and uh, he's he's a really, really cool guy. We um, I became aware of him because he was the uh, showrunner and producer of a show called Con Man with Alan Tudyk, and um, it's incredible. You should definitely check that out. Uh, but PJ is also uh, a really, really awesome author as well. He wrote a series called The Softwire uh, series, and it's it's so good. You definitely need to check it out. But uh, in this episode, we found out that uh, he he was in med school for a bit and then dropped out because he couldn't stand the sight of blood. Uh, then he got into fashion photography, which led to uh, getting into gear, which led into producing and all kinds of stuff, man. Uh, we talk about how he traveled with his books, like in a car, and went from school to school to school doing presentations. He put himself on the bestseller list by selling his book by hand, which is crazy. Uh, and then we talk about how he became friends with Nathan Fillion over uh, bonding over late night uh, gaming sessions, uh, playing Halo. Uh, how he and Nathan uh, came up with Kids Need to Read, which is an incredible organization. Um, he also gives really good advice for pitch meetings. Like if you're going to go in to pitch a show, um, great, great, great stuff. It's really, really cool. Um, and, uh, yeah, I really appreciate him giving me the time. Definitely check him out, uh, online. Also check out Your Mystical Guide, uh, on YouTube with, uh, his wife Marisa. And, uh, definitely check out Con Man as well. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, it's just so funny. It's so cool. And, uh, this was a really, really cool talk. Uh, so thanks, PJ, for your time. I really appreciate it. And um, without further ado, here is the uh, interesting podcast, episode number 48 with PJ Harjma. Theme song time. Can you hear me? I can hear you fine. Can you hear me? I can. I just hooked up this fancy mic, and I wanted to know if you could hear me. I can. I can. You sound well. Do I, I sound good? You do. How you doing, PJ? I'm good. How are you? Good. Good. Long time no contact, I guess. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's been a while. I haven't been doing cons in a while, so I'm not, uh, I haven't not. have been bumping into anybody. Sure, sure. I miss your live streams. Got to say that. Uh, yeah, there's a lot I got to do, buddy. There's a lot I got to do. <laughs> Oh, you've been good? You've been good? The family's well? Everybody's good. My girls are getting big. Um, um, Marisa's working her ass off on this new show I'm doing with her. Uh, yeah, we're just keeping busy. That's awesome. It's good to hear. Good to hear. You? Uh, good. Good. Same as well. You know, working the, working the regular job while chasing the dream, as you do. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm all throwing shit against the wall, hoping something sticks. That's right. That's right. <laughs> it's, it seems to be a tried and true method. Uh, but you, you're in, you're still in LA, right? Um, I moved the con man office down to Lake Forest and actually built a studio. What? So I've got, a, I've got a studio down here in the county where I, I live. So it just, I, I just got tired of driving into LA every day and taking the train. Fair. I started taking the train and then that got too old. And, you know, so I drive in now just for meetings. So I, I'm in there once a week. Sure. That makes sense. The, the, the just sheer amount of people, uh, in that tiny little valley is insane and when you have two kids it's you know it's you want to be able to just jump and go and do stuff you know like oh my god it's up for school tomorrow I'll go to target try going to target in la that's impossible <laughs> like, it's just something you can do yeah for sure but, i can walk to a target now i mean that's crazy sure sure it also blows my mind that like a lot of people don't live in la everyone commutes into it which just adds to the traffic of it all yeah so nuts when I was there, like, uh, I was there for two weeks a couple years ago. I took my mom because she wanted to. She had a lot of stuff like on a list, like a bucket list kind of thing that she wanted to do. And yeah. I was like, a lot of this is in Los Angeles. Let's go. And oh boy, that is legendary. Oh no, it's insane. It's just insane. 
It is. It really is. We we uh, we wanted to go to the Griffith Observatory, and the the maps took us to uh, like the the canyon that leads to the trail that goes up fifth. And I was like, oh, there's not there's not a road. I guess we're hiking. <laughs> and then we got up there and was like, wait, there's there's cars here. How did this happen? You can get lost in that park. That is a big ass park. It is. It is. We uh, we were like, oh boy, this is different. <laughs> Just be aware. Be aware, mom. But uh, where where are you from? You're not from LA. No, I'm from Toronto. Are you really? You're Canadian. Yep. That uh, makes sense as to why you're so nice. <laughs> Nathan and I like that, that crowd. We always make a joke about all the Canadians, and we're counted at a party. Go, oh look, how many Canadians are here? Oh, taking over, <laughs> taking over the world. That's right. That's I, you guys really are. That's awesome. That's awesome. When did you? So, what was that? What was that like growing in Canada? I left Canada in uh, 1989. I moved to Miami Beach. I was a wow. fashion photographer and. Uh, I was doing that in those crazy days. And then from there, I became a director and started directing commercials and uh, and then started producing them and opened a production company. And I was doing that. I moved to L.A. Uh, Marisa went to Brazil to work and uh, mm -hmm. I went to AFI uh, to do like a boot camp yeah. and uh, just all get assigned roles. And they were explaining what they were and. And the, the the role of producer, I'm like, oh, hell, I do that all the time. I'll, I'll do that. And so we did that for a month. And then a kid called me up and said, hey, I'm making a movie. Will you produce it for me? I'm like, sure. And uh, that was in 1998. So I just stayed in L.A. since then. Wow, really? What made you yeah. want to go, like, was fashion, like Miami was the place of fashion at the time? Because that's very oh, yeah. far from Canada. <laughs> yeah, Miami Beach was just a hotbed of fashion photography. So I used to spend six months in Miami and six months in New York. Okay, that is hardcore, man. Yeah, leaving yeah. Canada got right into the scene. Were you always interested in photography? You know, I quit med school. I was dating a model. And, what? Uh, you were in med school? Yeah. <laughs> you can't and just gloss I, over this stuff, PJ. <laughs> I quit that, and uh, I opened this modeling agency with this girlfriend, and I just took pictures, and uh, I fell in love with cameras. I mean, I still love gear. That's my biggest problem is I just buy gear all the time. By the way, I got a 35 millimeter if, if anybody's looking. What? Sit in my garage if somebody wants to buy it. Dude, that's crazy. What, what kind of doctor were you going to be in this a alternate surgeon. reality? I was going to be a surgeon. But I used to pass out at the sight of blood. <laughs> so the dean took me aside to think of another career. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Yeah, so. <laughs> just randomly want to be a surgeon. But can you imagine? That's a show. Right there, a surgeon who can't, who can't stand the sight of blood. <laughs> I would. It, when it, it, it put you in the uh, hospital right away. Like, they believe in a bedside manner. So, cool. and, the, and the the university is, every other floor is a research floor. And uh, so you would go in there, and, uh, like, on my first day, we started taking blood out of each other. And there was this kid, great kid, is this Jewish kid, and he just didn't want to be a doctor. But his dad was a doctor, and his grandfather was a doctor. Like everybody in his line was a doctor, mm -hmm. and he's here. And we're supposed to take blood out of each other, and he's and I'm sitting in a chair, and I'm strapped up, ready for him to take blood from me. And uh, he's at me, and he's and his fingers, you know, he's trying to hold his little needle, and he's shaking a little bit. And the asshole that I am, I uh, just as he's going to stick it in my arm, I go boo. And <laughs> no. He, he jumps back. He lets the thing go and it's like it's right out of a movie i watched the you go up in the air come back down and stick me right in the arm and just 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 like sticking straight up in my arm oh my god and my arm starts bleeding and i'm like oh my god look at me and i pass out <laughs> and the next thing i know i'm in the dean's office and the second time so i mean uh, that was the first time and then uh, and then the second time uh uh you go and doing rounds and stuff and i just i couldn't take it i was just like always woozy and and I couldn't get over it. I could not fix it. I could not. I still, I'm still that way. Sure. That, that's so funny. Literally a, a needle sticking up out of your arm. <laughs> yeah. On my left arm, just sticking right up out of the calf. <laughs> that's what you get, PJ. Yeah. <laughs> that's nuts. I had no idea you went to med school. Oh, for, me. for a bit. And a surgeon's a pretty specific way to go. Yeah, I was just looking for the which jobs paid the most. I, 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 my parents wanted me to be a doctor, and I just thought it was a way to make money. I never wanted to be a doctor. Sure, sure. It shows. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was never my thing. What did your parents do? 
They hated it. My grandmother, my, my parents didn't talk to me for two years, but my grandmother, who loved it, she had, had chronic high blood pressure. So she would always used to get, when the, dog, the ambulance would pick her up, they'd come, she'd make sure they took her to a hospital that I was working at. Oh, so when, there you go. when I stopped, she would get upset. So she used to send clips from the newspaper for hospital jobs. <laughs> my uh, my fiance is a nurse. And the uh-huh. day the day that she graduated, I was like, I'm never going to the doctors again. <laughs> <laughs> Just gonna have you diagnose me for everything. Check my blood pressure. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I'd be I'd be that guy. Were your were your parents in the medical field or anything? No, God no. No, they weren't at all. Really? Because that's typically how things go. So they're doctors or something else. And they're like, my child will also be this. Yeah, no. They wanted to say they had a doctor in the family. That's fair. That's fair. So uh, what was the... You got into the fashion photography in Canada and then moved to Miami Beach slash New York to do the fashion photography? Yep. That's how it went down. Gotcha. What was it about fashion photography as opposed to like other... All the women? Of it? Yeah, there you go. All the women? It was all the women. <laughs> that's what it was. Fair. Uh, it was no. I loved cameras. I like. I, I. I really fell in love with the camera. I was. I, I would go to a store in Toronto called VizTech, and I used to just go and hang out there and just touch the equipment. I love equipment. I, I should have opened an equipment store in Miami Beach when that was the beginning of the Haiti. I would have made millions. Yeah. Um, I still have the problem. Like I have to have this thing where I'm like, do I need it or do I want it? Do I need it or do I want it? Because I'll just go and buy just to have. Oh, I could get this, and I want this, and let's have this, and oh, I could get this. Sure, That's sure. Book doing that. Yeah. What kind of camera did you shoot on? Originally, I used to sh- I used to shoot on Nikon's, and then I lost so many of those on airplanes. I think uh... I, I lost two full sets, and then I, I would. Yeah, I'm old school. That was even before autofocus came out, and I refused to go to autofocus. And then autofocus came out, and the Canons came out, and so I got into EOS system, and I stayed there. Um, uh, yeah, I used to. Well, hell, I used to print my own negatives and everything. Wow, I've never been in uh, what do they call dark rooms? Yeah, I what? used to have a whole facility in Miami. You could come in and rent my dark rooms. Really? What? What? Yeah. What is a dark room like for someone who's never been in it? Um, at least it's just red. Does yeah, it, there, yeah. Is there a smell to it? Because it's uh, well, chemical the stuff. Fixer, the, the chemical fixer has a real bad smell to it, especially as it gets older. There's, there's a really strong chemical smell. But yeah, you, the whole red light thing, and you get used to seeing in the dark. Oh, uh, that makes sense. That makes sense. That's pretty cool. That's pretty. I didn't know yeah, that I, at all. But my wife, I, I remember taking her into a dark room in Toronto when we were just hooking up, mm-hmm. and we didn't get much dark room stuff done. <laughs> uh, there you go. There you go. Whatever works, man. Yeah. That's awesome, though. Yeah, I've uh, photography is a very interesting thing because there's so many different facets of it. Like there's some people that are just into landscape, some people into abstract. Fashion is a very specific thing, and it's so it's hard to it's hard to properly explain. Yeah, I got, once I like I had three million frames of fashion on file before I ever left Toronto, and then I moved to South Beach, and uh, and then I met Marisa. So I actually got out of fashion and went into commercial photography, and uh, so I started working with Crispin and Porter way back when they were just a twelve person shop. And that was that was the beginning of my advertising life. And so that was be about 94, 92, 92. And, uh, and then I just started doing all commercial advertising from then on. And I've worked with everybody, Nike, NFL, Qualcomm, Burger King, Molson's, you know, everybody. That is insane. So how, what was uh, – had you been to the States before this? Um, my parents had a place in Florida and it was, you know, growing up in Canada, uh, like a lot of parts of the world going United States was, you know, it was paved with gold and yeah. <laughs> you always wanted to go there. And it was, uh, it was quite an eye opener moving to the United States and, and seeing what it really is. The United States is really good at hyping up something. And, oh, yeah. and, and I just, I always wanted to live. I thought it was the greatest place in the world. And, uh, and I remember living in Miami and dealing and 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 learning about the Cuban culture and then them coming from Cuba and then in in L.A. and the Hispanics and coming from Mexico and and in New York, uh, you know, the immigrant culture. It was fascinating for me that where these people would leave these beautiful countries to come and suffer in the United <laughs> States. So much suffering. 
You're right. And, uh, and that was the, how that was part of the basis for the software books I wrote. Yes. And uh, the idea about you know going to a utopian planet, but basically being indentured servants. And, right. Uh, and it was just my experience of dealing, uh, living within the immigrant cultures and being immigrant myself. Right. And, uh, and uh, it was, it's quite an eye opener. It's quite an eye opener. Absolutely. I mean, it's different worlds. Uh, yeah. what, what is something that you would say, like, it takes for a photographer to succeed? As somebody who's, like, been there and done that. You gotta, you gotta love fashion. You got to really enjoy that. You got to breathe it, live it, drink it. That wasn't me. I just, that wasn't, it wasn't that much into the fashion side of it. Sure. I mean, I'm, I still can't dress myself. Yeah. My girls, <laughs> uh, the, the, the best fashion photographers I know really have an eye for that stuff. Um, they definitely have an eye for beauty. I mean, Randall Slavin, who is a great shooter now, and who I sold all my equipment to when I was getting out. He's just phenomenal now. Uh, I, I just don't have his sensibilities to the craft and uh, well, what he's shooting. I mean, I don't care. I'll give, give me a girl or give me a can of soup. It's just how do I light? I love the lighting part. I'm a very good lighter. I love, love lighting. Uh, but nowadays, it's a lot easier. You can practically light in a computer. You just... All you have to do is expose the thing, and you can do anything you want in a computer. Back in my day, if you shot something and it, there was a mistake, you had to shoot it again. Right. There was no full shot. Sure, and you didn't know you messed up until the picture developed. So you got the yeah. That was the the most anxiety was waiting to get the film back. Yeah, <laughs> for sure, for sure. So when did you start writing then? So the the writing part happened. I had a big studio in L.A. and uh, what year was that? I had finished that movie, Devious Beings, mm -hmm. and then I i think it was around 2001-ish, 2002. I just, I was done. I couldn't do it anymore. I was making the count people cry. I was just, I was a super asshole mm -hmm. on shoots. I just couldn't do it anymore, and uh, I was writing out of therapy, and uh, I would be, the, the studio was four floors, and I used to live uh, on the top two. And uh, I was just journaling, and uh, through the journaling came a character. I kept on going with it, and uh, it was at the time when Harry Potter just came out, and I was fascinated with the phenomenon of, of Harry Potter. So whatever year that was, because the book was kind of meant for reluctant boy readers, like teenage boys, and I and I had I, he has a, three of them, and I was like, hey, can you read this for me and tell me what you think? And because I didn't know. I didn't have any writer friends. Right. And so I said it to Eddie, and then Eddie calls me back, and he goes, who wrote this? And I go, what do you mean? I go, I wrote it. And he goes, no, come on, I'm your friend. Tell me, who wrote this? Because you know, there's so many ghost writers oh, yeah. in, in, with stuff. And I go, buddy, I wrote it. And he goes, I, I want to give it to my agent. Will you let me give it to my agent? And uh, I said, sure. And so he gave it to his agent, and then their ag agent called me and watching it for the movie rights. And I was like, yeah, but I don't even, it's not even a book yet. you got to. You get, we got to make it a book first. So then they hooked me up with an agent in New York. And uh, and then I had a next thing I knew, I had a four book deal. I was walking through the Home Depot and got the phone call. And uh, I came home, back to the studio and I fired everybody and shut it down. Oh, man. And I thought I was going to be J.K. Rowling's and uh, learned how hard it is to make money from uh, writing. And then I did that, or did a few of those, and then the recession hit in the in the two oh eight thing, and that was tough. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so I came back to advertising, and I went back to the agency side, and this I started working for Young and Ruby Cam, and and then Wonderman, they became Wonderman, and then Crispin found out I was back, and I went work over Crispin, and I was doing big campaigns for Best Buy and Southwest Airlines, and, and then when I was producing again. Uh, uh, Nathan and Alan came to me with the con man and said, hey, come make this for us. And I said, sure. And the rest is history. Man, that's crazy. So through journaling, you found this character and then a four-book deal. And yeah. That's nuts. So, like, how daunting was that to be like, you have this idea that isn't getting like, we want four of these. You know, it, was, it wasn't hard. I mean, the, I'm so attached to the software, and the story is, the world is so big, and it was, it, there's just so much fun stuff there that uh, I didn't find it hard at all. And plus, my degree in science 
you know, back to school thing. I have a degree in science, so I've mm-hmm. always been fascinated with science and quantum physics and everything that has to do with how the universe works. Uh, so I, the research part of it for me was a lot of fun. How could this work? And, and just, you know, just imagining what aliens would look like or, well, how could we do this? And so that, the, the, the world building was really my favorite part. The writing, not so much. I like being a writer. I don't like writing. Sure. That, uh, I, that's a common sentiment. I, I like having written. Yeah. <laughs> sure. That, and that's a really cool concept in the software series with, like, the, the four rings. And that's yeah. a good plan. If you have a four-book deal, you can divide it up that way. Uh, I wanted the, or the pebbles, you know, like the Hunger Games. I read the first Hunger Games, and I was like, my God, what a good book. Right. And then I read the other two, and I was like, huh. Did they tell her to write these other two? Like, did she ever have the idea for these? Because they didn't feel as thought out. And I would bump into that on other books. And I thought, you know what it is? It's once you get rid of the wonderment of the world, you lose a lot of that flavor. You know what I mean? Like that exciting stuff. Sure. And so with Sapphire, each book is on a different ring. And each ring has a different purpose for the rings of Orbis. And so each book had a new set of characters, a new set of locations, a new villain. So e- each book, although there's a thread that arcs through all four books, each had its own sense of wonderment. So in the first book where it was more about the governments and the two headed aliens, mm-hmm. the second book was basically took place in a ginormous fish tank. Right. And, and then the third book takes place in a game arena. And then the fourth book takes place in these in this in these slums, and there's a war. So every book had a, a whole new sense of wonderment. And yet it all came together perfectly. It's it's a really really cool idea. Wait, so Thanks. what uh what kind of sci-fi stuff were you into growing up? You had to have been into to pump out these kind of aliens. I was a big Heinlein fan. I was a big Asimov fan. Sweet. I used to read Baker. Um, uh, yeah, I really started reading horror first. I was I, I, I dropped out of English in grade 10. I hated English. Uh, I wouldn't read. I hated reading. Mm-hmm. And uh, I remember I was up at the cottage and it was raining and you can't go anywhere. And uh, I was just so bored out of my mind. I reached over and grabbed a book. And my mom used to buy those books from the Five and Dimes, so they would never have covers on them. So you don't know what you're reading. Of course. And I just opened it up and I started reading. I was like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Why can't books be like this? Why can't books be like this in school? And it was Carrie from Stephen King. Oh, nice. And, uh, and then so I went on a rampage of reading horror, and uh, that's all I read. And then I read Orson Scott's End, uh, Ender's Game. Sweet. And then that just put me into sci-fi. I read that book. I, just, I read nothing but sci-fi after that. And I'm not a fantasy guy. You know, I've tried... I'm not high fantasy. There's a couple books that I that I love. There's one I can't remember what the guy's name is. Where half of the story is a robot and the other half he's like a knight. Piers Anthony books. Yeah. The Blue Adept. The Blue Adept. That's what it is. Uh, I love those. Um, but yeah, whatever sci-fi I could, especially time travel. I love anything time travel. Uh, but you know, sci-fi is a map. Uh, when I was you know doing the publishing side of it, I remember. Uh, walking through uh, Barnes and Nobles with one of the buyers and uh, talking about science fiction. They're like, you know, Mo, science fiction, it's so hard. Nobody, no, no, kids don't read science fiction and they're going on and on. And I'm walking by this giant end cap of the zillion Star Wars books. And I pointed at them and I go, well, what about those? And they look at him and goes, oh, those aren't books. <laughs> <laughs> It was a it was a tough stigma in the publishing world with science fiction. I, it really had a it really had a bad rap, sure. and uh, you know, and then the vampires and werewolves took over, yep. and then that and that kind of stuck for a long time. Or or love triangles. Yeah, yeah, true. <laughs> the drama it. of it all. Yeah, I haven't I haven't read much lately. You know, there's just I'm not I'm not been in too too impressed. Um, I have a few favorites. I love Y and A. I love Y and A. Uh, sorry, Y and A. Y A. Yeah. <laughs> right on. Right on. How- I read a lot. Of, I read a lot of that stuff. Uh, Lainey Taylor is a friend of mine who I love. She writes such great books. 
Um, she wrote The Daughter of Smoke and Bone, which I just think is fantastic. That's more fan fantasy. I don't know. It's really sci-fi. I can't tell you what that, what that you would call that one. And she's got that new Strange Dreamer out, which is phenomenal. Right. But uh, there was a whole period of just all vampires and werewolves. And I was a big fan of Twilight. I, I met Stephanie right when she was putting the first book out. Uh-huh. Uh, I'd always been a fan. Uh, but good sci-fi lately. Got any suggestions? Oh, there's one that just came out that I'm, I'm, I want to read. I just got a notice for that sounded really good because I had a bit of time travel. Of course, I can't remember the name. <laughs> You'll have to go back in time. Yeah. To remember. But, yeah. <laughs> there is a, I feel like there is kind of a shift going from uh, from Vampires and Werewolves, but I mean. Yeah. It's it, just starting. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I've always wondered as writers, so from a writing standpoint, how do you come up with the names of these aliens? I don't know, the problem is sometimes you put placeholders in and then they get stuck in the software. There's a few placeholders <laughs> that that ended up staying there. Even the word nutneck was a placeholder. Um, yeah, you know, there's certain sounds that that's like K's mm-hmm. are better for villains. Goose, gur, goo, goo, goo sounds are better for you know some comic relief type Ophis characters. It's sure. this under the you know, it's 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 cliche in a way, but you just got to roll it around. You have a picture in your mind of what that alien looks like, and you know, does the name work? You know, you can, you can't call the alien Gertrude. You know, it's just not have that same resonance. Sure, sure. So it's a it's a process. It's hard. It's not easy. It's hard sometimes. Yeah, I, I when I when I was growing up and I wrote like little short stories just to pass the time, I would always be like, um. I have a friend named Carl. This guy's name is Carl. <laughs> Zero creativity whatsoever when it comes to I think, things. I think alien names are easy than the than the character names, like the human names. That makes the, sense because you can just those are hard take for me. Because you know, live with that name. You know, live with that name. Yeah, that's true. And, and you have so much uh, baggage, you know, with certain names. You know, there's you know, oh, oh, I dated a girl with that name. I can't. You know, I can't. I can't. I can't. Oh yes. Oh yes. I I just had another author on. And I asked her the same question about naming, and she said uh, what she did to name people was she would look at her the character's parents. It was like, what would they have named this character? I was like, oh, it's a very in-universe way to look at it. Yeah. So like if their parents are like kind of boring, then they would have kind of a boring name. But if they're really interesting, it'd be kind of different. And like, you do get your name from your parents. I understand this logic. Well, I'm going to use that now. Right, right. I'm here to help, PJ. And yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. So at, at what point were you like, I'm going to make this a game? So when I was uh, my good buddy for, uh, he made there something about Mary, and uh, he wrote the the uh, Looking Glass Wars series. And, and when he, him and I were both, he was writing the Looking Glass Wars while I was writing the Softwire, and we were doing it in hiding because we were embarrassed that we were like actually going to do this. <laughs> and... Uh, one night over dinner, we we kind of confessed to each other, and so we we, you know, we teamed up. We're like always oh, trying to help each other, and as we book our deals, we were told that oh, you're authors now, you need a website. I and mean, I would go to these websites that all these authors had, and they were quite masturbatory. I didn't find any reason why a kid would come back to an author's website. Sure, and. I went and looked at, well, so where are kids? What are they doing? Where are they hanging out online? So you're talking 203, 204. The book came out in 205, so it was in that time period. And, uh, you know, that was back in the day of uh, Gaia Online when it started. There was a thing called Neopets. Oh, and yes. then And then I met these two guys that had this idea for this ridiculous website called Penguin. <laughs> look, look how big that guy. Yeah. And uh, and I I went to Frank's house for dinner and I all day long I put together this presentation and I go Frank, we're gonna build a game, we're gonna build a website, that's a game, and yeah, if people right. come hang out there between books, and we're like brilliant, let's do this. Who's gonna do it? I go we're gonna do it. I go we don't know how to code. We'll learn. It can't be that hard. It's just it's one <laughs> zero. And. Uh, and that's what we did. And, and the Rings of Orbis website, which is not up anymore, I built that one other guy and learned how to do HTML and PHP and Flash. And that's all that. And I used to learn ZBrush to make the items. And I built that every day, working on that relentlessly 
from scratch and learning as I went along. And, uh, you know, that was tough back in those days for paywalls and getting people to pay online. And, oh, yeah. and then my, my publisher didn't want to even put the website on the book because they were afraid the kids were going to somehow get to porn. Yeah. Like that was, oh, no. you know, the publishing was waiting for the internet to go away back then. Right. And, uh, yeah, so it, it was always an uphill battle. I mean, it got featured on the front page of the New York Times, and I still couldn't get my publisher to promote this online game. So I do have the distinction of creating the first ever game for a book. That is amazing. When you were doing that, did you already have designs of the aliens like drawn out, or did you make them for the game, and who did you get to do that? So it's just ballsy of me. I've always been a... a a fan of, of sci-fi art mm -hmm. like in my library upstairs that you have all these different like any that's, i collect them whatever i can get and uh i was in love with a guy's art named start near oh. and as ballsy as i was i just sent him my book dude and I, I said i want you to make me some pictures so we read the book he fell in love with it and, uh, you know, we had plans to do more, but we were both very busy. And, uh, he just loved the world and how big the world was. And uh, he created the cover of the first hard back and he created all the characters for my aliens. Wow. And then and then then he gave me his protege. Uh, Choi was his last name. Was it Steve Choi? Stephen Choi? Mm -hmm. And then I started working with him. And and then Frank was reaching out to all these famous guys. So we were just. We were just collaborating, and people loved the story, and they did the did the art for me. That just goes to show you never know if you don't ask. Yeah, I didn't know who Stefan Martinier was. I just liked his art. Right. No, <laughs> I didn't know he was such a, uh, you know, just such a fantastic big wig genius. Sure, who drew your characters. Yeah. Well done, PJ. Well done. Yeah. That is amazing. I lo I also love that you were like. How do we get kids involved in this? And as far as kids reading, because I think that's really, really important. And then you came up with kids need to read. Well, the, the, the reading thing with kids just floored me. Like, I would be in these marketing meetings. And now remember, I'm coming from a big background of advertising, so I know my shit when it comes to advertising. Yeah, of course. And I'm in these marketing meetings with these people, and I have, I have a 26-page document on all these ideas on how to share the books with the kids. And I go through it, it all, and I'm talking to these people in this boardroom, and uh, and they're like, "Well, we've we've got some plans to send some emails to some influential librarians. Great. Um, and when we talk to the kids, well, and then we, you know, we're going to uh, have a flyer at the book uh, at BEA. Great. Mm -hmm. But when we talk to kids, well, you know, when you do a signing at the BEA, you'll be able to meet some more librarians." And we talk to the kids. And then somebody finally goes, well, we never talk to the kids. For a kid I'm like, let me get this straight. Let me get this straight. So I wrote a book for teenagers. And we're never going to talk to them about the book? Jeez. No. And I was like, okay, we're fucked. Yeah, we're right. Fucked. <laughs> this is, this, we're, 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 this is, this is ain't working. So uh, it, it, it was, it was, when my book came out, the the Barnes and Nobles rep at at my publisher quit, as the same time as the kids buyer quit at Barnes and Nobles. So it was a bad time, and my book fell through the cracks. Mm -hmm. And and so I was not waiting for them to do anything. And what I did was I just packed my car up with books. And I would just call schools. So I want to come in there and I want to give you a free presentation about a book. And no school would turn me down. That's amazing. And, and then they, and I'd say, the only thing is, let me sell my books. And I went in there. I didn't go in there with a, sitting in a chair and opening my book and reading my book. That <laughs> did not happen. I went in there. I didn't, even, I didn't even have my book in my hand. I went in with a a, a television commercial. I went in with the video games. I went in with a movie. I had kids acting out scenes of the movies. Ooh. I had a 
I brought a bodyguard in a black suit and black gases, black glasses chained to a metal case. And inside that metal case was an alien artifact. that was the origin of the entire storyline. Kids didn't get to see it till the end after I told them this alien ghost story. Mm. Three times, three times I lost control of the kids. Like they literally rioted. <laughs> and, and I put the book on the bestseller list by selling it by hand. Dude. Because you couldn't get you could get the book in Barnes and Nobles. You had to order it because it didn't get. There's a word for it when they just when one buys, they put it back on. I can't remember what it was. Right. And, uh, and I sold. I hand sold my book all over North America, and uh, I won awards with it, and 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 got into reprints. And you know the, the publishers suck at marketing books. I'm sorry. If there's any publishers listening there, you know that's true. That's right. <laughs> and uh, and. Uh, and you know, but at no support, you know, you just, I buy the books. I had my own account at random, bought my own books and I would take them and I'd sell them. And then, so teachers would reach me at her because it got to the point where people would call me and then I started getting paid to go, but they're only rich schools. So right. I would, okay, fine. You rich, you can, you, you're going to pay me 1200 bucks or whatever it is to go to your school and tell these rich kids about the book and they'll all buy the book and they'll go home and they'll sit there and go, but they school on the other side of the track. They're not even going to, they're not even going to know about this. So I, so I'll come cool. If you get me uh, a, a, a visit at that other school as well. So we'll do yours in the morning and them in the afternoon or vice versa. And they go, yeah, but they can't pay. I go, no, no, no. I'm doing them for free. You're paying. <laughs> there you go. And uh, I would go there and I would, I would go to these schools and the, the you know, sometimes a principal would greet me at the door and they go, listen, thank you for coming, but our kids don't read. So I, I don't be disappointed if nobody buys your book. And I would have kids in lineups buying. So I would go into a, a school and half of them would buy my book after I did that presentation because I made them aliens and reading and science and it was fun. Yeah. And they, what hit them? I was like a rock star walking in there with a torch <laughs> like that. And there were cases where I would pack my shit up and I would go to the car and there would be like the Pied Piper. There'd be these kids following me out into the parking lot and trying to talk to me privately. And like one kid would come up to me and she said, you know, my dad got me a, no, I had a movie ticket for my Christmas present. And uh, can I trade it for you for one of your books? Oh. And then another kid, uh, another kid came up and he said, my dad won't let me buy books. Can, can I have one of yours? And so, and, and then there would be teachers that all these kids crazy for a book when they hadn't been able to get a kid to read a book at all. And, and they would be, you know, going into their own purse and, you know, teachers don't make any money right. and they'd be their own purse trying to scrabble together money for, to, to put a copy to share across three classrooms. And I'd be like, what the fuck, man, this is screwed up. It is for sure. And, uh, you know, and then meanwhile, we're always trying to cut money into education and blaming the teachers and everything. I'm like, yeah, you go, go stop doing that from your private school uh, right. thing and, and go, go check it out. You know, I've been at schools where they mop the lunch tables with the same mop they mop the floor with. Right. You know, it's shitty out there. So I was telling this Nathan and Nathan, both Nathan's parents are, uh, are, uh, uh teachers right. and, uh, Nathan's like, we gotta do something. And uh, so the idea that we came up with is like, listen, I'll sign the book. You sign the book. Nathan read some chapters of the first software, which are online somewhere. Right on. And uh, and we'll sell those signed books at an extra price. So so if a book, the book is like, I don't know what the book was, 17 bucks for a hardcover. Right. We'll sell that book for with the signature, Nathan's signature, my signature. We'll sell that for five. And uh and then you take the rest of the money and you go buy more books and you give those books free to those schools you go to. Right. So that's what that's how Nathan and I started doing that. And then uh, the brown coats came to us and wanted to help. You know, the brown coats are always about charities and oh, yes. they're all trying to help people. And uh, and Denise Gary uh, sort of spearheaded it and over now when it, you know it kid, kids needs to read got way bigger than what nathan and i wanted to do and nathan had his water charity and yeah. and i just didn't have the you know i i didn't have the time to do a full-blown charity sure. so denise took it over and you know she's still going strong and joss we you know donates to it every year i think and uh you know nathan and i don't do much there anymore but 
you know, she's taken that into something amazing and they give books to kids. That is incredible. And it, I think that's really, really important work as well. Like you said, there's obviously a need, but then there's a massive disconnect between the people that are in the supply and the kids that need. So much so they're like, yeah, kids don't even read. But you know firsthand that isn't true. No, it's because the, you know, the problem is, is that books are given to kids the same way we give our kids vegetables. Right. This is good for you. Eat this. Mm -hmm. And this is the one that somebody on a list or in a room said is the best book. And therefore, they should read this. I tell my dogs, give it five pages. If you don't like it, toss it. Go to the next one. Not every book is for everybody. It's the same way where not every television show is for everybody. For sure. And that doesn't mean it's good or bad or you're an idiot or not. You ju I just, you know, I like certain types of books. Find the book that, and just, you know, read all those. And, uh, you know, the publishing industry tends to get caught up on these little rare nuggets of books that, that they love. I, I equate it to film critics that have seen everything and, and make popcorn movies where there's a 14 year old kid or 12 year old kid that, you know, the first time they saw Pacific Rim, it was like the best movie they've ever seen in the world. Sure. It's the same thing with books. You're not going to get a kid to, to read, you know, some gold medal winner, uh, where, when there's the soft wire out there, I mean, it's get them, get them hooked into reading and then they'll go and explore. And I tell kids, it's like, look, you like my books? Great. You, because a lot of people, they go, oh, I never liked science fiction and I now I love science fiction because I started your books. And mm -hmm. I've had guys come up to me at cons and go, I'm a scientist because I read your book. Dude. And, and, uh, and I'm like, yeah, so let them read the soft wire. And then if they like that, go grab a Heinlein book, you know, go through Heinlein. And then from there, go to Asimov. And then maybe from Asimov, jump up there. Now, at that point, you'll see a lot of different ways that you, you want to go and, and, and ease your way into science fiction. The problem with a lot of science fiction writing today, it's not a problem. I mean, it, it, a problem puts a negative connotation on it. But the, the, they want to get into the the magnificence of the world so fast and you get inundated with terms and words and character names that have no relation to your everyday life and especially someone who's not reading it and know they got to become familiar with this stuff and they tend to just feel stupid and they throw it away and i just you know i'm i have a degree in science and i pick up some science fiction books and i still feel stupid sure. you know it's like i can't get it and so with the software, I took all the science and pushed it to the back and brought the stories of the, and, their, and, their, and their relationships up front so a kid would relate right away to that character and then slowly started putting the science into it. And it's funny because the software is labeled a hard science novel. Yeah. And uh, it's not. I mean, you've read it. It's not It's not a hard science novel. Right, right. It, it, I, God, I love all of that. That's so cool. And just the, the story, you realize that's like a movie. Yeah, like they won't sell my books. Get a car. We're doing this ourselves. And yeah. Well, you schools. know who did that? You that at the same time, and I'm like, God bless you. You. He went and got a truck, like, a, and lived in the truck, and and drove all around the country. And uh, I was like, because I made a joke with with Frank. I'm like, buddy, let's just get a motor and go around the go around the country, and uh, and and sell our books that way. Just go on the road for two years, and. Uh, Frank was like, no, nah, I'm going to do other stuff. But mm -hmm. you know who did that? Who? You know who actually did that? Hmm. Ernest Cl Player One. What? For real? Yeah. I remember when that book came out, and uh, I had, I read it. I got an advanced copy of it and thought it was one of the best books I've ever read. And uh, and he had the same problem in the beginning. It just was not going to get noticed. And so he just put everything in a was it a motorhome or something he did? And he just drove around to schools and just just did not stop. He was more relentless than I was. Wow, that's incredible. And now Spielberg, Spielberg's making this movie. Yeah. <laughs> Good yeah. Lord, it's amazing. He, he was relentless. I was very impressed by what he did to get his book noticed. You know, and it, his, I'm not, my book is no Ready Player One, but, but my God, he was he just... What he did was fantastic. It is. It is. What you did is fantastic. Starting Kids Need to Read, uh, that's that's incredible. Good on you, man. Uh, mm -hmm. So you started that with Nathan Fillion. How did you guys meet? So we were – I used to live with Patrick Van Horn, uh, Sue from Swingers. You oh, ever see that movie? sweet. Yes. <laughs> that's awesome. So 
we I threw his 30th birthday party at this huge house. We used to, when we finished shooting beans, that's how I met Patty. Mm -hmm. He had this guy came up to him and goes, hey, listen, do, I've got these huge mansions in L.A. Do you want to live in them as long as you furnish them and I can send people to go buy them? It takes a year to sell one, but you can live in there till that. Patty didn't have any furniture. Marisa traveled all over the world modeling, and she had a warehouse of furniture. So let's all room together. There you and go. We decorate these mansions and throw parties. And on one birthday party, Nathan came. And uh, and so what year was this? This had to be 2001, 2000. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Marisa met him, and I didn't, I didn't meet him. And uh, then we were out one night. We were at a at a, a very famous celebrity's birthday party, and we were bored out of our mind. And <laughs> and uh, Marisa goes, "Oh, this is this is Nathan. I was telling you, but he's Canadian." And I'm like, "Oh, I'm Canadian. Oh, okay, we're automatically friends." That's right. That's how that works. <laughs> and then Marisa uh, Nathan was saying because it'd been a that, that was March to Christmas uh, period, and uh, Nathan said to Marisa, he "Goes, uh, what did you uh, do over the holidays?" And uh, uh, Marisa goes, I'm a little embarrassed. We spent the entire Christmas holidays, entire weeks, locked up in the loft playing Halo. There you go. And Nathan goes, <laughs> Nathan goes, you had me at Halo. And then from that night, that was, that was, that was, I think, January 202. And uh, we started playing Halo every Sunday night till uh till monday morning like right through till monday morning mm -hmm. we started uh we, we we played four on four halo it was actually five three on two uh -huh. and uh we, they, they were epic and everybody heard about it. that's how nathan ended up doing the voices on halo they just heard about our epic uh so we did it for two years and then nathan the third and he would uh he would interview, like he would try people out in order for them to come play on his team. <laughs> and, and, uh, and uh, oh my God, the people that we went through. And, uh, and then when Serenity started, not Serenity, when Firefly started, mm -hmm. uh, he met Alan yes. and said, do you play Halo? And Alan's like, and was, they became instant buddies. And, and, and Alan was like, I don't play video games. And, he goes to learn. So Alan started coming over and we called him the great equalizer because he really sucked in the beginning. And, uh, and then they got so good. The uh, Nathan, Corey and Alan got so good that it became so depressing to get our asses handed to us <laughs> all night long. Like we'd come over and we'd start with dinner and we'd have drinks and then we'd play to the next morning. And it was so bad that everybody would, like you couldn't miss. If you missed, you were you were you were you were. Like sure. We, we move shooting schedules around, vacations around, <laughs> so that so that we could play, and uh, we did that a long time. And then it was mostly Halo One and then Halo Two, and I didn't like Halo Two, and, mm -hmm. and then it went on from there. That's amazing. These these are those kind of stories that like end up on DVD specials and whatnot. Yeah, it's just yeah. beautiful synergies. You're Canadian. <laughs> That is gold. Halo. Well done. Well done. That's so how then, we met. So then, uh, you know, a little bit, and you, you get this you get this idea. Alan has this idea of Con Man, which uh, I absolutely loved, as you know. Yeah. Um, how, how did that come to be? What was the pitch for that? Because I'm, I'm so interested, because it was amazing. Well, you know, I was back producing then, mm -hmm. but I was on the commercial side. Right. And... Uh, Alan had this idea, and and uh, he had worked with Nathan on it, and uh, and Alan wanted to get it made. Asked me to come and make it with him. He, he didn't have the technical side. I think he actually wanted me to actually shoot it in the beginning, and I'm like, oh, buddy, I haven't shot in years. I'll produce. Right. And uh, and we went traditional route first. We went to the production companies, and we had the meetings and. You know, the studio execs that would blow smoke up his ass just because they wanted to, you know, keep a relationship with him. And right. we, signed a, we signed a shopping deal with somebody. And eventually we were going to make a deal with a big studio after a year of, of having all these people go, oh, that's where those geeky guys go. And well, my, my daughter's 
boyfriend went to one of those and and it was just at the dawn of where everybody's like oh we got to capitalize on this geek culture right and uh and we we're gonna go to this huge studio to sign a deal and uh at the I could see Alan wasn't happy and I said to him I go buddy we don't have to do this I'm advertising we can we can crowdfund this I know those fans I know what they they want and we can crowdfund this back then though crowdfunding had a stigma still to it even even when we first started streaming video had a stigma I remember that we made a, a movie and it went straight to Netflix that was an embarrassment right right and now everybody lines up to get on Netflix 100%. so there there was a bit of a stigma back in back then. And then the idea of doing independent television was unheard of just a short time ago. Right. And, uh, and, and Nathan Allen said, you think you can do that? And I go, I can do it. And worst case scenario, we come back here. And then, so we turned the car around and we, uh, we went and, uh, 30 days later, we were crowded 30 days after that, we broke records. Yes, you did. That was incredible. And then uh, that was how we met. Yeah. At uh, at MegaCon that year, because yeah. I went, I made it into those like twenty seats <laughs> at the uh, what was it Miller's Ale House? I think it was for the party. Oh right, you were at that party. That's right too. I forgot about that. And then with MegaCon, what a lot of people don't know about MegaCon is, of course, we went back there after, but I had gone to MegaCon and shot footage. Right. Quietly with a cameraman and we just snuck in well, when we had permission, but nobody knew what the hell we were doing. Right. <laughs> and, uh, a lot of the crowd footage that you see in season one of con man is either from MegaCon or Phoenix con, or there's an anime con. Oh my God. I can't remember the name of it now. Mm -hmm. I don't remember what it was called. Sorry. I forget. And okay. um, that's all. That's the crowd footage we use in all the Sure, sure. That's amazing. That show was so good. That party was really fun. That was it was. Party. That was the, the lady brought the cake. Yes. With Nathan and Alan on it. Yep. I was that there was because fun. of you. You, because uh, we'd met uh, in person. I'd watched all the live streams and checked in on them every time. Uh, and we ran into on the floor, and you told me you're like at around seven. Watch Alan's Twitter account. I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll do that. And then seven rolls around, and I'm just refreshing Twitter. And he's like, we're at Miller's Ale House, first come, first serve. And we're like, we need to run. <laughs> <laughs> that was a fun, fun party. It was. You, you had some weird costume on when I bumped into you. Yes. Or you were with holding like something orange in your hand or something. What was that? They're cabbages. <laughs> yeah, cabbage, that it was. That's what it was. It was so strange. I was like, well, we're, we're doing this. I'm going to go yeah. say hi to PJ Harshman. That's a cabbage merchant. <laughs> It, a long time ago. It made an impact, so so it worked, I guess. <laughs> Good stuff. That's right. Um, so I love that also through, on, you know, you had a tie-in game, uh, the, yep. the Con Man game, and then you even had Spectrum. Yeah, we're working on a Spectrum game right now. What? I remember the Spectrum yeah. comic. You had a Spectrum game. That's amazing. Yeah, the Spectrum. I've, I've seen the first play on the Spectrum game. Really cool. What? Um, it's more it's more sci it's more of a sci-fi game where you get to be the crew of uh, Spectrum and you go through the different worlds from the Softwire novels and uh, you have to beat up the aliens and help Cathy rescue other people in the universe like her. That's so cool. I love that you like have an idea and it's got to be advertisement like how good you are at that that you have all mediums. Like it's not just one thing, it's also a game, it's also a comic, it's also this it's beautiful. It's good synergy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like winning the world, too. They call me greedy. Hey, you made it, so <laughs> I, w I wouldn't say that. Uh, how fun was that show to make? Because it was really it, fun to watch. It was, okay, it's stressful. Of course, you know, of course. so much weight on your shoulder, but it was, it's one of the best experiences of my life. I mean, it was so much fun. And so many of those actors are, are friends. Right. So to be able to do that and work together where we run the show it was just such a fun environment you know i would do it again in a heartbeat sure sure it, it it's it's so funny like alan is already one of the funniest people ever but that show like really it, the comedic timing was just a thing he really is a genius though when it comes to comedy it's it's he's like an uh i don't not an idiot savant that's the wrong way to say it but like he's just he, he it's just he's he's he knows it 
like he breathes. Right, he just get. And he knows when to wait and when to pause and how to make something funny. And he would do it in the edit, and it would, you know, a frame here and a frame there, and it, and a sound effect here and a sound effect there, and it took it from a dead scene to a hilarious scene. Okay. Yeah, he's. I don't know anybody as funny as him. Agreed. Agreed. It's amazing. So co-running, co-producing, producing and co-running a show. Like, what did you learn coming out of that sort of process? Because it's, it's a huge, huge thing you undertook. What did, I mean, it, producing is producing is producing. So right. there, there was nothing outside of my wheelhouse mm-hmm. uh, in that. I mean, I learned different things I got to deal with with unions. You know, I mean, I, I never sure. deal with unions on that scale. Um, you know, what did I learn? That's a good question. You know, it... it, it or what was the most you know, how difficult? To deal with studios, how to deal with studios and lawyers and agents, and you know, I'm mean, not my favorite thing to do, but sure. you know that whole thing, and you know, learning some of the the speed. There are a lot of talent that are out there, and they're wondering why they they didn't get offered a job, and like you got offered a job, but your agents didn't tell you about it because they didn't want you to do it. Right. You know, there, there there's some there's some sneaky, dirty things out there that that I'm not a fan. Of, of uh, uh, but you know, I I I think. If what I learned was that I have enough knowledge and know-how. Knowledge and know-how, they're the same thing, but I'm using those two separate things to make it sound like more. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> and that it gave me the confidence to go out and go, oh, you know what? I'm going to do more of these. I'm going to I'm gonna do, I know what I'm doing. I know how to produce. I know how to get shit done. Let's go do some more. Sure, sure. And is that where Red Bear Films came from? Well, Red Bear Films has been around forever. It's uh, You'd be Philip John Studios, but somebody stole a check from me in Miami, bought a car, and drained my accounts and bounced all my checks. Ah. So the bank said, listen, it's just a paper name. Give me another. We'll start a new company. Give me a name because it's, you know, back in those days, your your reputation, you, you, it was everything. Absolutely. So I used to call Marisa Red, and she used to call me Bear. And so I'd be like, I don't know, Red Bear. Call her Red Bear. What? That's awesome. And that, so that's how Red Bear came about. See, that's another one of those. It just makes sense. Yeah. Given everything. So you have a method for naming everything. <laughs> <laughs> I do. There's a purpose behind it. That's right. That's right. Do you have a specific thing like commercials, shows, features, stuff like that? Is there uh, something that you prefer to do? It's producing is producing, but is there like a special place for one of those things? No, I mean, right now, so Red Bear's got three divisions. We have the, the television side, so mm-hmm. I've got three different new projects out there right now that uh, that our studios are, are selling. A traditional scripted television. I got a really funny one with Nolan North and Gray McTavish that's not scripted. It's super funny. Sweet. Uh, uh, so there's that side. You know, we're always pitching. And then there's the branded side where we create you know, commercial content for, for, for companies. So we just did something with shell oil and that's the, that's the day to day stuff. And then we do our, we do our own content. So we've got that show with your mystical guide with Marisa. And so we do all that in house. So it's basically those three divisions that, uh, that, and I I tell you, I like one more than the other. Sure. Sure. I just like being on set. That's what I do. I love being on set. That's my favorite thing. A lot of people don't like being on set. They, they think it's a, it's tough. And I think that's my favorite thing. If I was a, a kid living in Hollywood, I probably would have grew, grew, grew up as a set rat, just going around and just set to set, just working all the time. Because I just love being on set. Sure. I mean, especially someone as creative as you, you're in the midst of the creative storm that's all happening. That's pretty cool. What, a, what's a, what's an adv- what is advice that you would give to someone who wants to do sing? It's a tough one because there's different types of producers. Mm-hmm. People have asked me that question before. Of course. And, you know, the thing with producing, on the simplest level, tech management. Uh, if you can sense. be hired as a, a producer, a work-for-hire scenario, then you just need to be a good project manager. But those are hard producing jobs to get. You know, you can get those at an agency or a producer for hire at a studio. Those are jobs to get. The other type of producer is the producer who can put stuff together and uh, and, uh, and, and, produce. And, <laughs> and can get stuff made. There's a lot of producers in Hollywood, but they don't have any on-screen credits because they can't get anything made. So it re- it's really about your connections and, and, and can you 
actually get stuff on screen and that's the hardest part and there's no path there's no there's no particular way to do it you know if, if you know, get it get your hand book or a book and 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 work to get that made find attach yourself to some sort of property if you're not making it yourself and uh and work that through to get made sure that's a that's actually really good advice like there is so much material out that if you wanted to be a producer you just kind of find something and then make it happen yeah, and then you just put the package together and, and then hopefully get the meeting and keep hounding to get the meeting and network and all that crappy stuff that I hate doing. Yeah, that's the part. You know, say show business and business is the longer word. It's like it's very much business as well. Oh, yeah. And uh, con man is obviously open doors for me now and I'm very grateful for that. It makes it a lot easier for me to pick up the phone and make a phone call. Sure. Uh, you know, so once you, you know, then you can... You know, then you, you 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 just keep piling them on, and you know now I'm get a sophomore hit next, and so yeah, we'll that's we'll amazing. See. That's amazing. What? So you've been to a ton of pitch meetings. Are those like they go in the movies? And what advice someone who's going into something to pitch? Well, know who you're pitching. Know what they what they're looking oh. for. Bring something they're not looking for. Um, and then you, it's all about the package. You're there because they can't go do it themselves. So what, you know, you can have an ideas are a dime a dozen, scripts are a dime a dozen. What kind of, what kind of package can you put together? What pieces can you bring to this table? You know, in, in reality television, it's like you have access to a world that no one else does. In, in scripted, do you have a, do you have a, 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 a person, a director, a showrunner, a, an actor, somebody that you can a, attach into that package so that it makes it have value? Sure. Is there a such thing as being too prepared for a pitch? Like if you come in and just have a ton of stuff, like drawings and ideas and slideshows and all that stuff, is that is that too far? Last week I did. No. No, it, it depends what stage you're at. They want less and less now. Mm-hmm. Uh, once you get to the once somebody gets attached and then you get into the selling stage then then you have to add more elements uh sure but you don't need the giant show bibles and show decks anymore to get started um with three different pitch meetings a couple weeks ago and uh one was right away one with some changes and now we're negotiating and the other one was just a flat out no and the flat out no for me what I thought the best idea, mm-hmm. but when I me sitting in there and watching creative people pitch, the reason I feel that that one person didn't get it was because they didn't show the same passion for their project as the other creators did. They didn't, they didn't tell it in a manner where that the people across the table needed to to hear more. Right. So there, there's something to, there's something said about, sure. about how much passion can you bring to the description of what you're doing. You have, and there's some people that are brilliant at it. I've seen some guys and you just, they have you eating out of the palm of their hand. You're, there's, you're telling this story and you're hooking them along the way. If you're reading or doing it dry or, or being very low key, not going to happen. Sure, that makes total sense. Passion is infectious, like for anything. I'll hear somebody talk about something I'm not even interested in, but if they're passionate about it, I just want to hear more. I don't know, something passion. Like and a- so how do you turn that on in a meeting where you're nervous and you're afraid of screwing up? And, you know, so you practice. You know, one, sure. one thing that I, Frank Bedour taught me that. He goes, you're going to a pitch meeting, practice. Practice, practice, practice. Sure, I think that's great advice. And I just realized we've been talking for over an hour already. So, nice. uh, yeah, dude, I, I hope you've had a good time. This is really fun I, to catch up. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Glad to hear you're doing all right. Um, where can people find you online? Um, PJHarsman.com. It's two A's. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Twitter. Just my name, PJ Harsman. And uh, check out Your Mystical Guide. It's pretty funny. It's on YouTube. It is. And uh, and then uh, we got lots of Spectrum stuff coming. So the Con Man fans, uh, they'll, they'll start seeing some of that in a few months. Sweet. That's very, very exciting. Well, thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thanks, bud. And...
Hey, friends. Uh, thanks for listening to the interesting podcast. Uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, if you'd like to follow me, I'm on Twitter and Instagram at Jedi Brian. If you wouldn't mind going to iTunes and rating this podcast five stars, it really does help book bigger guests. It also pushes us to the front of uh, iTunes so that people can find the show easier. And uh, yeah, let me know what you thought um, online. So until next time, be well.